Today we're going to model the daily average temperature of Sydney Observatory. Now we're going to be looking at temperature data over the last 160 years. We're going to identify a long-term trend and then model seasonal variance using a Fourier series. Now because our choice is going to be a first order Fourier series, we're actually able to use nonlinear uh, least squared regression to be able to estimate these parameters of the model. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So detrending and modeling seasonal variation with Fourier series. So essentially it's just a time series decomposition. And this is a technique that actually splits the time series into several different components each representing an underlying pattern and category. So here is our time series, Y, which is actually our temperature, our daily average temperature. And then we've got a trend component and a trend we're just gonna notice, is it decreasing, is it constant, or is it increasing over time? We have a seasonality component, which is just the periodic signal that is being observed over a given frequency. And then we have the noise, which is the variability in the data that cannot be explained by the time series model that we have. So the model that we're actually gonna have is deterministic seasonal mean temperature of our daily average temperature uh, series. And we're gonna model this with a trend component and a seasonal component. So daily average temperature series is from Sydney Observatory. We have data going back from uh, 1st of January 1859 to today. So just over 160 years. Now the temperature series that you can see here is just plotted um, from the late 90s through to today. And what you'll notice is that we have quite a lot of variation in noise. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually denoise this daily average temperature series. One of the ways we can actually do this is by using a simple algorithm that signal processing industry have used for exactly this purpose, and that is convolutions. Now convolutions is just a mathematical operation whereby we are convoluting one function with another. Now here a convolution is just the area under the curve of these two functions that are moved towards each other and then away from one another, aka convolved. So an applied convolution ends up looking like this. Here I've just used a square function and then convolved it with our time series data. And essentially what we've got is a nice, smooth, denoised temperature series. So let's start with the long-term trends. If I take the rolling mean over all these uh, annual periods, then what we get is a temperature series that looks like this. Now this is, looks like an incredible linear trend to me. So I am um, proposing that we use a linear model with just a intercept A and then a gradient B. So in summary over these 160 years, we can see that the, um, uh, the long-term trend in that average has gone from 17 degrees uh, Celsius through to 19. Now for the seasonal variation, what we're going to do is we're actually going to detrend that time series. So remove that moving average over time. And then I'm going to plot the temperature series. So this denoised uh, temperature time series reveals that temperatures have somewhat uniform peaks and troughs. And what you can see there is that potentially we can actually use a Fourier series to model this. So here's what a Fourier series looks like. We've got um, A0, which is our constant, our intercept, and then we have uh, the summations over different orders of sine and cos curves with different coefficients. So essentially here, I've got a model for seasonality, which is based on a complete general uh, truncated Fourier series. However, many papers have actually suggested that temperature um, variation can actually be captured by just the first order Fourier series. So that is where I is equal to one, and we only have the first order here. So we just have simply a sine and then a cos function. Now, one paper actually used a simplified representation of a single sine curve, and I am actually betting that this is going to be able to hold all of the information from our time series. Potentially, this is just going to be overfitting with another two parameters. So we are going to compare the two of them and see what the models look like. Now with this second model with a translation in that phase of theta, what we can actually do is separate this out using one of the trigonometric identities into uh, sine and cos. Now what you'll see is that we can actually define uh, two coefficients, a1 and b1. That's just gonna be corresponding to alpha sine theta 
and then uh, alpha cos theta. We can then rewrite this uh, temperature seasonal component as A1 cos omega t plus B1 sine omega t. Here alpha is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of A1 and B1 coefficients and then the theta is equal to uh, arctan uh, A1 over B1. Trended and seasonality removed. Well essentially we have this deterministic seasonal mean of the denoise time series that can be modelled like this. So essentially we've got this temperature um, of our trend in our seasonal component and here are our two models that we're going to compare. The first one is that general uh, first order Fourier series and then the second is just the sine curve. Now the assumption that we're going to make here is that uh, the speeds of the seasonal processes are the same and that is omega um, 2 pi over 365 days in a year. Now I don't want to actually leave that as a parameter in the model because again I'm worried about overfitting and then funny kinks so we'll actually enforce that detail. Now model fitting by nonlinear least squares. Here we're actually going to be using SciPy optimized curve fit, which is an implementation of the Levenberg Marquard theorem, so LMA theorem. And essentially this is just a nonlinear least squares problem um, and solution that combines both the Gaussian Newton uh, algorithm, so GMA, with gradient descent. Now, we won't get into the details, but all we're doing is we're trying to minimize the sum of the square deviations, and the sum of the square deviations um, are actually calculated by using those two algorithms before. So when I first look at the two models overlapped with each other, they were essentially the same, but obviously the model fit general in the black has uh, two more parameters than the uh, just the model fit with a sine curve. So therefore from a principle of parsonomy, I was definitely going to pick just the sine curve because I could represent all my deviations and my model completely with uh, just the sine function. However, there is a second thing that I noticed that was wrong with these two images. If you see the first image is from the first period from 1859 in the initial years and then the last period is from the last couple of years and what you'll notice is that there's actually seems to be a bit of a phase shift. So the peaks are still occurring in the data in the temperature data and the troughs at the exact same time. However, what's happened is that my model has actually fitted. We've got a leading phase difference with our top graph, so in the earlier years, and then a lagging phase difference in our models in the uh, most recent years. So I sat here and stumbled over this question for a while before re realizing that it was our assumption on our speed of the seasonal processes, so our frequency, that was incorrect. Here I assumed that this omega, the frequency, was 2 pi over 365, but because we're using such a large um, number of data points, approximately 160 years, the phase shift occurs because a leap year is adding up to approximately 40 days. So this 0.25, so because a year is 365.25 uh, or thereabouts uh, days per year, this was leading to a 40 day phase change. Um, and essentially when we remade the assumption of uh, omega 2 pi over 365.25 uh, we got a great fit for our trend and seasonality. So our actual model that we end up with is um, our simplified model so by parsonomy we chose the sine curve and then the trend component with our a and b terms. So with all our fitted coefficients in there um, we have uh, 16.8 for A, our intercept. We've got a really small coefficient, 6.32 times 10 to the power of negative five for our gradient in temperature over time. And time is ordinal numbers starting at zero from uh, the year 1859. Now for alpha, we've got 5.05 and then our omega, uh, our defined frequency and theta parameterized ended our estimate ended up as 1.27. So now that we removed this deterministic seasonality um, from our time series, what's left? What do the residuals look like? And essentially this detrended and removed seasonality form. Now here in our plots, 
On the left hand side I've got residuals but then obviously I've made the time series in the second plot at the bottom um, a lot smaller so you can see more granular changes. And on the right hand side I've shown the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation. And what I want you to note is the partial autocorrelation function really has quite a high co um, coefficient in the first lag term. So this is the first issue. Essentially we can see that there's strong partial correlation identified at one lag. And this is indicating that maybe we might need some kind of autoregressive model to actually account um, for this change in temperature. Now, as we'll find out later, this is no coincidence. And we'll explain why in our next video when we go into the stochastic modeling of daily average temperature. Now, the second issue occurred when I looked at the probability plot model. So I looked at the QQ plot um, where we're comparing this error distribution to the normal distribution. On the left hand side, I have ordered values of my temperature deviations and on the uh, X axis, I have uh, the normal distributions. And what you can see is a huge deviation after two standard deviations. So in terms of Z scores after two standard deviations, uh, the probability of getting that within my data set was about 3.6 versus the normal distribution of 2.3. And we can see a large amount of skew in the histogram plot. Um, so 0.63, and we can observe that kurtosis, so the fat tails 4.2 in comparison to three for the normal distribution. So the second error was that the error distribution is not normally distributed, um, and we've just determined that visually, um, but there are models that you could check with, but this is because of the presence of extreme temperature deviation. This is another issue that we have to handle of our model and get to the bottom of why this is occurring. And I have a sneaky suspicion it's to do with temperature volatility and seasonality. So here are the academic papers that I took a look at to actually compile some of these, this information and this series in general. So thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next one where we go and explore some of the issues that we've just faced 